uh, Ambassador Bader, your friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please pardon me for not mentioning the names of the VIPs present here today, but there are simply too many. Uh, if I did, it would probably would have taken a long, long time. But I am very grateful that many high-level officials from the NSC over there and various ministries, the legislators, former officials across the ministries, uh, ambassadors, generals, and many distinguished professors and uh, journalists. And last but not least, the AIT and Chamber of Commerce are with us today. This is Taipei Forum's first public speech by an honored guest from abroad. We will sponsor more in the future. Above all, today, I'm truly privileged and honored to host a speech by Dr. Bader, Ambassador Bader. He's now, uh, his official title now is the John Whitehead Senior Fellow in International Diplomacy at the Brookings Institution. But most importantly, between January 2009 and uh, April 2011, he was the Senior Director for East Asian Affairs on National Security Council in President Obama's White House. He, we didn't hear much about him in the press during those days while he was there. And this was because as the right-hand man to President Obama on East Asia in general and on China in particular, he was extremely busy preparing everything and coordinating anything. He spoke with President Obama about policy before meetings before trips, before phone calls, and during general discussions on policy. He accompanied Secretary of State Hillary Clinton on all of her trips to Asia. And he joined other officials on numerous tours throughout this region. He was among the privileged few, indeed very few, who helped the only superpower in the world to decide and execute his policy for the most complex and fastest growing region in the world. Dr. Bader, Ambassador Bader, earned his master's degree from Yale University, PhD from Columbia University. He spent 30 years at various posts in the Department of State, NSC, and USTR. From 1999 to 2001, he was appointed an ambassador to Republic of Nam Namibia. His career path overlapped with Taiwan several times. Very early on, he was in Taipei studying Chinese. From 1997 to 1999, he was Director for Asian Affairs at NSC with responsibility for U.S. relations with PRC and Taiwan. Between 2001 and 2002, Ambassador Bader served as the Assistant USTR responsible for, again, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Mongolia. And in that capacity, he completed the negotiations for Taiwan's accession to World Trade Organization. In October 2008, when the Bush administration announced an arms sales package to Taiwan, Dr. Bader was the surrogate speaker for candidate Obama. Then. Secretary, at the time, the Secretary of State, Condi Rice, called Dr. Bader and asked him not to criticize the, deci the decision. And that was, we all remember, that was in the death heat of the U.S. presidential campaign. But Dr. Bader, a Democrat, indeed did not criticize the Republican administration's decision on arms sales of Taiwan. What a bipartisanship. In January 2011, Ambassador Bader from his NSC position, he orchestrated another package arms sales to Taiwan. In addition, he helped promote U.S.-Taiwan relations on various issues, VWP, visa waiver program, high-level visits, and Taiwan's participation in international organizations. I can go on and on. For these, for all of these, we are eternally grateful. As you can see, uh, it's too shy to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm holding in my hand a new book. That's his book. 
uh, it just came out. Uh, in fact, two weeks ago, I traveled through New York City. I went to Barnes and Nobles. They had e-copy, they didn't have hard copy. And he brought with him some, some hard copies, and some are on display outside that door. And this new book is called uh, Obama and China's Rice, an insider's account of America's Asia strategy. As far as I know, this photograph and the many photographs inside are authorized by the White House. But the contents were his memoir, his personal account of what he did, what he thought, what he, what he said uh, when he was in the highest pinnacle of power. And the book is so new, frankly, I haven't read it yet, but I'm sure we'll all find it a small gem of knowledge and wisdom. So without much ado, uh, please join me uh, with a bigger applause to welcome Ambassador Bader to give us a speech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Suchi. Um, I used to work closely with Suchi in his previous capacity for uh, public meetings and much less public meetings. Uh, it's great to see him back here in a public capacity. Uh, and much gratitude to him and the Taipei Forum for hosting me here today. And it's also great to see lots of old friends from. Uh, Days in Washington, Ambassador Ding, Ambassador Chun, and many others. Um, it's terrific to be back in Taiwan. As uh, Suchi mentioned, I first visited here in 1980. I lived up in Yangchang, uh, studying Chinese not as successfully as I would have liked. Um, the Taipei I'm visiting this week uh, scarcely resembles the Taipei that I lived in about 30 years ago. Uh, at that time, Yuanshan Dafangjian was the only class hotel in town. The streets were lined with the charming shops, many of um, marginal, secure, marginal sanitary standards. Uh, motorcycles outnumbered cars by orders of magnitude. In short, much as I loved Taipei in those days, uh, it did not feel like a world city. Uh, this Taipei is from the five-star hotels to the eight-line highways, from the luxury goods stores to the industrial parks and research and development uh, uh, centers. My friend Tom Friedman uh, recently wrote a column that, that began by saying, and I paraphrase, people ask me what is the most impressive country in the world, uh, and I answer Taiwan, because it has become uh, advanced and developed without significant resources, based solely on an educated, skilled, uh, and entrepreneurial uh, uh, educated citizenry, uh, and on policies that have sought to integrate Taiwan uh, thoroughly and as intricately as possible into the uh, world trade and investment system. The other aspect of Taiwan that is uh, so very different from the place I lived in 1980 is, of course, the political system. Taiwan then was a one-party state with limits on dissent and even stronger limits uh, on political organization. The rule of law was compromised by the one-party state. Uh, today's Taiwan is a dynamic democracy that has just completed another successful and free election that inspired people around the world and more particularly across the strait. Um, I have never believed that democracy solves all our problems. Now, sadly, the performance of our own American democracy uh, in the last decade with unwise and costly foreign intervention irresponsible accumulation of debt, deteriorating infrastructure, and breakdown in inter-party cooperation 
uh, illustrates that. But, but democracies are resilient in ways that autocracies are not. They are self-correcting. Those who believe in American decline were proven wrong 30 years ago and will be proven wrong again. That is a lesson that I hope Taiwan citizens reflect upon as they consider their own political polarization and political noise. Uh, I've had the pleasure of these last few days since I arrived with meeting some of Taiwan's top political figures. And I'll meet with more. President Ma received me yesterday uh, and we had a very warm conversation. The accomplishments of President Ma and his administration are much admired and appreciated in Washington which welcomes not only Taiwan's economic recovery, but also the building of cross-strait ties and reduction of tension. Something good for Taiwan, good for the PRC, and good for the United States. I also met with the leader of the DPP, which has contributed greatly to Taiwan's democracy through the courage and persistence of its forebears during the dark political years of dictatorship and its formation of a strong competitive opposition party. I'd like to talk uh, more broadly today about the policy of the Obama administration toward Asia and about the book I wrote upon leaving the administration on that subject, which Su Chi kindly uh, mentioned and displayed. Obama and China's rise recounts U.S. policy toward Asia at the time when I worked at the National Security Council from January 2009 until uh, I left in April 2011. I should add that I left uh, entirely voluntarily. Uh, at my age, uh, I felt it was time for someone um, with uh, stronger legs and a little more energy uh, to pick up, uh, pick up the crushing burdens of working at the White House. Uh, the book is fundamentally a memoir. I hope that at a time when people are paying attention to what has been called uh, the U.S. pivot to the Asia-Pacific, a uh, term which, by the way, I do not like and do not use, uh, you will find in this book the foundations of a policy that rebalanced U.S. priorities toward the Asia-Pacific. I hope those who read the book will remember that this is a memoir if it sometimes seems to give me an outsized role. That's what memoirs do. That's why we write them. Um, this is a book about what happens, what happens in the region, how the Obama administration helped to shape events, and how we responded to events. The Obama administration had broad strategic goals in the Asia Pacific at the outset, but did not have a detailed roadmap Obama admired the foreign policy of George H.W. Bush, Jim Baker, and Brent Scowcroft. They were superb adapters during a time of turmoil and upheaval that they could not have anticipated. The collapse of the Soviet Union and its empire, the Iraq invasion of Kuwait, German reunification, civil war in the, Bal in the Balkans, uh, and Tiananmen. Uh, what were President Obama's strategic goals in the Asia Pacific? And briefly, number one, a belief that we needed to rebalance our global priorities and pay much greater attention to Asia. We made this clear in statements by our top foreign policy people, uh, by their early travel, and in meetings with foreign leaders. Secondly, a stable relationship with China with more intensive interaction with its leaders and cooperation on international issues, and the need for stability and a peaceful environment in cross-strait relations. Third, on North Korea, to quote former Defense Secretary Gates, a refusal to buy the Yongbyon plutonium production horse for a third time but a willingness to negotiate bilaterally or multilaterally toward the goal of complete denuclearization. 
on the basis of North Korea honoring its international obligations and commitments. A fourth, strengthening and participation in regional institutions, or so-called architecture. Five, strengthening alliances and partnerships, principally with Japan, South Korea, uh, India, and Indonesia. Uh, six, maintaining forward deployment of our armed forces in the region. And seven, agreements to expand trade and exports to the region. And that was the strategy. There are always, of course, unexpected developments that arise. I'd like to talk about how we both implemented the strategy and dealt with the development. Uh, first, North Korea, since that was the issue that posed the most uh, immediate danger and consumed so much uh, time, effort, and energy. We came into office prepared to continue implementation of Assistant Secretary Chris Hill's plan for dismantling the Yongbyon uh, plutonium reactor. But North Korea quickly, effectively eliminated that option. Intelligence in February 2009 showed North Korean plans to launch an international, an intercontinental ballistic missile, later announced to be a satellite launch. This all probably sounds familiar to you as you read today's headlines. Uh, we could not proceed with implementation of the dismantlement uh, plan and further international shipments of heavy fuel oil under the shadow of an ICBM launch. So it's fair to say that North Korea is a very significant hardening of attitudes uh, in Obama's national security team. Over the next year and a half, North Korea undertook a series of provocations and we undertook responses designed to change their calculations. North Korea threw out IAEA inspectors and shut off surveillance cameras. They launched the planned long-range ballistic missile and numerous smaller ones. They conducted a nuclear explosive test in June 2009. They sank the South Korean naval vessel, the Chonan, the following year. They shelled Yongpyong Islands in November 2010, killing four people. And they announced they had a uranium enrichment facility at Yongpyong. In response, we put in place unprecedented sanctions, including a near total arms embargo, international arms embargo, not merely American embargo, which of course already existed, uh, and international financial sanctions through the UN Security Council resolution. We promulgated an executive order singling out North Korea for sanctions for the first time. We substantially developed our alliance with South Korea. We postponed transfer or operational control over South Korean forces in wartime until 2015. We deployed a U.S. aircraft carrier to the LC, not once but twice. We conducted joint exercises with South Korea along its western and eastern coasts. And we supported South Korea as it conducted live fire exercises after the Yongpyong Island shelling. While we actively supported this South Korean show of strength, we also took steps to limit the risks of escalation. President Obama developed as close a relationship to South Korea's President Lee Myung Bak, as I can recall our two presidents ever having. President Lee came to the White House twice for high-level visits, hosted President Obama in Seoul twice, and became one of Obama's favorite counterparts. We concluded the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement, and we engineered South Korea's hosting of the Nuclear Security Summit, which is going on right now. Well, we also work closely and effectively with Beijing to prevent further North Korean provocations. More on that in a minute. So what's the outcome? Uh, we strengthened our alliance with the Republic of Korea. We communicated effectively to North Korea that provocations and extortion would lead to punitive responses, not rewards and concessions as in the past. And we continue to make clear 
our willingness to talk to the North bilaterally or in six-party talks, but only on the basis that it also talked to the South, that it refrained from further provocations, and that it accepts a monitored freeze on its uranium enrichment program. Uh, I'd be pleased in our question and answer session afterwards to talk to you about recent developments in North Korea and how I think the Obama administration is responding and should respond. Uh, in short, the administration feels the need to reinforce the messages sent in 2009 and 2010 and will not proceed with the planned food aid so long as Pyongyang insists on a so-called satellite launch. A second, China. Clearly the most important challenge facing our policy in Asia and facing the countries of the region. From his first meetings, President Obama made a number of points clear to our Chinese interlocutors. Obama respected and welcomed China's rise with the stated expectation that it needed to be consistent with international law and norms and not destabilize the region. We wanted to work with China to address international issues. Iran and North Korea's nuclear programs were at the top of the list. We were and are a Pacific power and intended to maintain and strengthen our ties and relationships uh, in the region. We expected our relationship to have elements of cooperation and competition. We want to increase the cooperative elements and successfully manage the competitive ones. We have a one China policy, insisted that resolution of differences between the PRC and Taiwan be peaceful, and intended to continue to provide arms to Taiwan consistent with the Taiwan Relations Act and the 1982 Joint Communique. We also welcomed progress in building cross-strait ties and reducing cross-strait tensions, and endorsed policies that contributed to these goals. Well, there were three broad phases in our interaction with China during my tenure. In the first year, we sought to lay the groundwork for a stable and positive relationship. That involved an Obama trip to China in November, numerous phone calls between the two presidents, uh, the creation and first session of the Strategic and Economic Dialogue, a joint statement, which I excruciatingly negotiated, laying out the goals in the relationship, generally close cooperation on North Korea as we agreed upon a strong UN Security Council resolution and presidential statement, the beginnings of significant cooperation on Iran, parallel stimulus packages designed to prevent the world from sinking into a depression, and cooperation between Obama and Wang Jiabao at the Copenhagen Climate Conference. But we believed it was critical in the first year to put a floor onto the relationship, to build a degree of confidence so that we would have capital to draw upon when inevitably problems arose. We did not want to repeat the mistakes of 1980 and 1992 presidential campaigns, uh, and to a lesser degree, 2000, when unwise campaign statements led to serious problems in the first years of the new presidencies. In the second year, 2010, China's diplomacy altered, but not for the better as China manifested more assertive international behavior with a heavy dose of bluster. They sided with North Korea in ways that encouraged bad behavior, which I described earlier. They publicly sought to exclude U.S. military vessels from the Yellow Sea. They engaged in a confrontation with Japan over fishing rights around the Sengaku or Jiaoyu Islands that led to a temporary freeze on Chinese exports of rare earths to Japan. They threatened to halt imports of products from companies that sold arms to Taiwan, including some of our biggest exporters. 
and they asserted extensive claims unjustified by international law in the South China Sea. Now, the Obama administration pushed back hard against these steps. We also took steps of our own that inevitably caused frictions. In January of 2010, we announced a $6.4 billion arms sale to Taiwan. We made the decision in a series of high-level meetings chaired by the National Security Advisor and his deputy in January 2010. In my view, this was the first time during Obama's tenure uh, in which an arms sale decision was both appropriate and desirable. The Bush administration had provided a similar size package for Taiwan in October 2008, so there was no earlier urgency to provide arms. The President's trip to China in November 2009 and the absence of an Assistant Secretary of State for Asian Affairs until the summer of 2009 also argued for a pause. But we also arranged a presidential meeting with the Dalai Lama in February 2010, uh, three weeks after the announcement of the arms sale package for Taiwan. Uh, I've described our reaction in Korea. With regard to the South China Sea, Secretary Clinton articulated our policy fully for the first time uh, in Hanoi at the ASEAN Regional Forum meeting in July 2010, stressing the importance of freedom of navigation, the need for all claims to be based uh, on land-based claims legitimate under the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, the importance of negotiating a code of conduct, the need to avoid threats or intimidation, and the need to respect free commerce. Um, this statement elicited a short-term hostile reaction from the Chinese, but over time it has had the desired effect of encouraging the Chinese back toward the negotiation and discussion with other claimants over code of conduct. And in the case of Japan, we made clear publicly our commitment under the Mutual Security Treaty to the defense of the Senkakas. By the end of the year, the Chinese understood that uh, its excessive assertiveness had not only damaged its relationship with the United States, but with its most important neighbors, with Japan, South Korea, Indonesia, India, and Vietnam, to name a few. Arguably, their only improved relations were with Burma and North Korea. That's not a good report card. Now, this was the setting for an about face. State Council Dai Binguo, who oversees China's foreign policy, wrote an important article reiterating Beijing's commitment to Deng Xiaoping's principles of prudence, patience, and never seeking hegemony. Uh, this article was published on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs website in November of 2010. This signaled a definitive end for now to an intense official debate on the course of Chinese foreign policy and demonstrated that at least Dai and Hu Jintao understood the costs China had incurred by their maladroit diplomacy. Uh, it provided reassurance to China's neighbors, uh, and equally importantly, it signaled internally to China's foreign policy and national security community that assertiveness had its limits. Uh, as tensions in Korea rose in the wake of the uh, announcement of the uranium enrichment program and North Korean shelling of Yongpyong Island, we coordinated closely with the Chinese to prevent further North Korean provocations in response to the South Korean live fire exercises that I just mentioned. Led by Dai Bingwo, 
China communicated clearly to Pyongyang that acts of aggression and armistice violations would not be tolerated. North Korean provocations temporarily abated. Finally, Hu Jintao visited the U.S. Uh, in January 2011. The visit went well publicly and privately. It came immediately after an invitation to Secretary Gates to visit China that restored military to military relations at the highest level. But this ushered in the current phase, a period of limited expectations as China approaches uh, a leadership transition, some continued progress on security issues, and a greater focus on the economic issues that confront us. A third, Japan, with whom our relationship turned out to produce more challenges than we anticipated. And from the beginning, we wanted to signal that we were giving higher priority to Japan, with whom the relationship had frayed somewhat at the end of the Bush years because of disagreements over the North Korean nuclear issue. So we invited Prime Minister Aso to be the first official visitor to the Oval Office in February 2009. Secretary Clinton made her first overseas stop abroad in Tokyo that same month. The first big challenge we faced subsequently was the victory of the Democratic Party of Japan, ushering in only the second period of non-LDP rule in six decades the first one having lasted only a year in 1994-95. That turned out to be a considerable adventure because of the particular characteristics of the Prime Minister Yukio Hatayama and the direction in which he sought to take Japan toward equidistance between the US and China and the East Asian community excluding the United States expulsion of the Marines from Okinawa, halt of support for U.S. operations in Afghanistan, uh, a potential alteration in nuclear deterrent security policy, and overall a fraying of the U.S.-Japan alliance. We worked our way through the Hatsuyama period with care. President Obama made clear privately that most of Hatayama's proposed measures were completely unacceptable to us, but avoided a public shouting match that might have polarized relations and encouraged Hatayama to rally the Japanese public against foreign pressure. The Japanese public, in fact, quickly lost faith in Hatayama, and his mishandling of the alliance was one of the reasons for the precipitous decline in his popularity and his fall from power. His successors, Khan and Noda, have rebuilt the alliance, walking away from Hatsuyama's flirtation with neutrality. Um, incidentally, the way we handled relations with Japan during that period perhaps has some relevance uh, to U.S. reactions to changes in government and policy elsewhere in Asia, whether it's South Korea, Thailand, Thailand or Taiwan. We respect the will of the people who put governments in power. We respect their right and their desire to reformulate and alter policies. We do not forfeit our right and obligation to make clear our policy preferences, our security needs, and our national uh, interests. Our relations with, uh, with newly elected uh, governments um, frequently produce ups and downs when this happens. We do not challenge the legitimacy of these governments, nor seek their removal from office. We work with them. But anti-Americanism on their part, if it occurs, generally turns out to be a poor formula for their success. 
uh, and um, both at home and abroad. It may produce short-term tactical successes, but it is strategically counterproductive in countries for whom close security relations with the U.S. is important and whose populations have historic, warm, and positive feelings toward the U.S. The last big challenge we faced in Japan was the triple disaster of the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear meltdown at Fukushima in my last month at the National Security Council. The response of the U.S. military was superb and helped to persuade the average Japanese of the value of the alliance at a time of dispute over Okinawa. Uh, you'll have read in the media not long ago of frantic debates within the Japanese cabinet at the time in which they discussed whether Tokyo might have to be evacuated under certain contingencies. Uh, the Japanese government did not share those particular fears uh, with us. But for our part, we were faced with highly uncertain scenarios about the potential spread of radioactivity from Fukushima. Uh, indeed, I was concerned about the risk of starting carelessly down a path that could have led to a drawdown or even evacuation of our bases uh, without a sound scientific basis for such decisions. Fears that we might move in that direction were prompted by exaggerated scenarios for the spread of radioactive plumes from the reactors. We stepped back from such actions by developing a model, working with Lawrence Livermore, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, that demonstrated that under the worst imaginable scenario, radiation exceeding environmental protection agency standards would only come to about 75 miles from Tokyo, far from our bases. Alas, just a very few words on Southeast Asia. Uh, the Obama administration was determined to raise the place of Southeast Asia uh, in our attention to the region. Obama's personal decision to join the ASEAN-based East Asia Summit to try to make it into the region's premier organization dealing with political security issues was the, the prime step. He did so in the face of conflicting recommendations from his advisors. Um, in that case, well, not always, I was on the winning side. Uh, we opened a diplomatic dialogue with Burma that has led to some impressive results. President Obama met annually with the leaders of ASEAN, 10 countries, for the first time the president has done so, which again took some courage given Burma's presence among the 10. Uh, and we created a comprehensive partnership with Indonesia, a country with whom Obama has a special affinity from his youth and where he is viewed as a rock star. In sum, we demonstrated greater U.S. commitment to the Asia-Pacific region at a time of economic hardship and budgetary constraint, we maintained force levels and forward deployment. We believe this was important in its own right, and especially so in a period of potential instability accompanying China's rise. We decided to embed the U.S. more firmly in the region's emerging multilateral architecture both in our interests and as a comfort to countries in the region who frankly were seeking it. We dealt cooperatively, extensively, and candidly with Chinese leaders, making our, pos our positive view of China's rise clear, as well as its regional role, and working with them uh, with limited but real success on global issues while pushing back against overreach. We encouraged continued reduction of cross-strait tensions. We enhanced Taiwan's security, and we took steps to strengthen the relationship between the U.S. and Taiwan. We built the U.S.-South Korea relationship to an unprecedented level of cooperation and trust, in my view. And we shaped North Korea's choices to prevent a replay of past cycles and encourage a more successful approach. 
We kept the U.S.-Japan alliance intact and strong through a difficult period. And we opened a dialogue with Burma that is producing results. Um, I'm proud of this record. I was pleased that it generally enjoyed bipartisan and public support. My book recounts what we did under the guidance and leadership of a president who sought deep engagement in the region. I hope you all will find the opportunity to read it and enjoy it, uh, and then tell me what we did wrong. Thank you all for listening. Look forward to your questions and your comments. How would you like us to proceed? Um, would you like me to just uh, recognize people? Or, uh... substantially reflect those of my colleagues uh, in the administration and my colleagues generally throughout the national security establishment of the United States. Um, Taiwan's security uh, is important for multiple reasons. Uh, the first being that um, Taiwan, uh, Taiwan should not be compelled to a status against the wishes of its people. Um, Taiwan is a, uh, has demonstrated that it is, a, uh, that it is free, it is democratic, and Taiwan, and it would be completely contrary to U.S. principles to accept the notion of a free people being forced to accept a status uh, that is not of their choosing. Now, this is, uh, this is embodied uh, in U.S. law, and it is implicit or explicit uh, in our statements in the joint communiques where we talk about the necessity for peaceful, peaceful resolution. 
what peaceful resolution means is that no resolution can be imposed upon the people of Taiwan contrary to their wishes. So that is sort of principle number one uh, in terms of why the question of, quote, abandoning Taiwan is unthinkable. The second is the impact that it would have on stability uh, in the region. Uh, the use of force uh, against Taiwan uh, would send a resounding signal uh, to Japan, to China's neighbors, uh, about the nature of China's rights uh, and about the balance of forces uh, in the region that would have a profound, profound negative impact. You know, this is not something that you know, we spent 60, 60, 70 years establishing our presence uh, in the region uh, with the goal of protecting stability, freedom, and prosperity. Um, you can't simply remove a gigantic brick or cornerstone from this edifice and expect security and stability uh, will survive. So the notion of abandoning Taiwan uh, strikes me as a, a fringe notion. Um, one occasionally sees uh, an article uh, offering ideas along these lines by people I've never heard of. Um, the, the nice thing about living in a free country is anyone can say anything, and they usually do. Uh, and the more out of the mainstream it is, the more likely it is to be published. Uh, so that's why you've seen articles from, from this school that I wouldn't even call it a school. I'd call it kind of a a group of kids in the playground. Um, so I, you know, I, I think there's a pretty strong consensus um, now uh, about the importance of, of Taiwan, the importance of its democracy, the importance of stability, the importance of peaceful resolution. Now, you know, it's, it's always dangerous to, to speculate, uh, especially about the future. Um, you know, my own view uh, is that over time, um, my own view is the situation gets better, not worse. Now, are there are different trends uh, on both sides of the Taiwan Strait, and one can come up with different scenarios um, uh, leading to dire uh, conclusions and analyses. Uh, I actually tend to think the other way. Uh, my own view is that over time, uh, China. China is going to evolve uh, in a the direction of a more participatory pluralistic system. I hesitate to use the word democracy. Um, I, I can't uh, pinpoint either when um, Chinese institutions will be different or what they will look like when they are different, but I'm fairly confident that uh, uh, at some point, they will not look like what they look like now. Um, and when, uh, uh, as China evolves, uh, I think that, that inevitably that's going to have some impact on attitudes across the street. Again, I don't want to get into uh, outcomes in large part because that's not our business. I mean, the whole point of the language of the communiques uh, is and it's not up to us to make these decisions. Um, when people come to me with proposals, suggestions, questions about you know, outcomes, um, I basically say, well, that's a very interesting academic exercise, but it's not something uh, that we can either predict or frankly, we should have any control over. Um, this is a matter for for people here to decide, not for people in Washington to decide. What we can do is we can help create an atmosphere uh, in which the right decisions are made. And the way we do that is um, by having a good, solid relationship with the PRC, a non-confrontational relationship with the PRC, uh, in which the PRC feels that uh, its rise and its emergence uh, 
are viewed positively and are helped by a good relationship with the U.S. rather than by a hostile relationship with the U.S. Uh, and by providing Taiwan the means to defend itself and pro by providing the assurances that we provide under the Taiwan Relations Act. Um, by encouraging uh, further integration of PRC and Taiwan into regional um, political and trade uh, institutions. I mean, this is what we can do, not come up with a formula or a blueprint or an Oslo process uh, for Taiwan and the PRC. That's not what we're here for. Microphone over here. In year 2006, yeah, when you paid a visit to Taiwan, uh, attending a conference in uh, the uh, year 1996, uh, Taiwan, Taiwan Street Crisis, yeah. uh, you have given us an excellent account on world affairs and uh, US-China-Taiwan relations in particular. Uh, there, has, uh, there have still been uh, some controversies and uh, questions uh, unanswered. Uh, first question is, uh, uh, that uh, uh, China uh, has claimed Taiwan, Tibet, and Xinjiang uh, are its uh, core interests in, in, uh, in its uh, uh, joint statement with uh, President Obama. And uh, why Taiwan was in, and uh, why the wording of core interest uh, was, was skipped in, in their second uh, joint statement uh, is uh, once enough. Uh, and the second question is, uh, China has uh, claimed, also claimed, at least according to the report of Wall Street Journal, uh, China has claimed that uh, South China Sea is also uh, its a uh, core interest. In your, in your personal exchanges of views with Chinese officials, do you think China really attempts or, re or does not uh, attempt, uh, attempt to uh, incorporate uh, South China Sea as a uh, uh, part of the core interest? Well, thank you for the question. Um, I'm sorry I don't have the language of the, uh, the joint statement of November 2009 in front of me, although I spent scores of hours negotiating it. Um, it's a painful process which I never wish to repeat. Um, we also, as you know, did a joint statement in January 2011 when Hu Jintao visited. Um, you are correct that the November 2009 joint statement uh, has the Chinese referring to their, uh, to their supposed courageous. We, we do not, we do not endorse their core interests uh, either in that statement or anywhere. Now, that language was uh, we spent more time on that paragraph than we did on the entire rest of the joint statement by a considerable amount. Um, without going over the entire negotiating history, uh, the Chinese were looking for specific references to uh, Tibet and Xinjiang as core interests. Um, Again, someone may have a joint statement here, but we resisted and did not accept their formulations. We ended up with formulations um, that said nothing new. And I was very clear in my discussions with Hui Yafei, the Chinese negotiator, when we were talking about Taiwan, that nothing in this community, in this statements, it was not a communique, affected in any way U.S. policy towards Taiwan or altered in any way the language in the communiques. In fact, at each stage in the process, I shared the language that we were discussing with Taiwan government to the point where the PRC negotiators were quite irritated wondering, what well, was this a three-way negotiation? Uh, and I made clear that we were not going to accept language relating to Taiwan that was politically problematic 
the title. Pure and simple. Um, we can go over that line by line. Uh, I'd rather not ever see the language again. Uh, the, uh, the 2011 joint statement um, has no reference to core interests. Um, you know, I went to Beijing in September 2010, met with senior Chinese officials, and at that time they used a different formulation about the term core interests. They didn't talk about Taiwan, Tibet, and Xinjiang as core interests. Rather, they gave a much broader formulation. They talked about their core interests as being um, national sovereignty, um, the effect of uh, the governance of the Communist Party, and economic prosperity. I'm not paraphrasing, but there were three core interests which were of a general nature. They were not the specific territorial uh, claims. Uh, I think that I think that they realize that these territorial, the excessive concentration on these territorial issues, uh, was not a good way to describe their their national interests. Now, specifically in the South China Sea, there's been much arguing about that. I mean, I was at the, South, the Strategic and Economic Dialogue meetings in 2010, during which uh, it is alleged that Dai Bing Wall referred to South China Sea as a, as a core interest, he did not. Um, I was never the meeting where I heard a senior Chinese official refer to the South China Sea as a, quote, core interest. I was on a visit in February of 2010, right after the Taiwan arms sale announcement of the meeting with the Dalai Lama. It was a difficult visit. Uh, and during that visit, a senior foreign ministry official listed China's six top priorities. I cannot remember the phrase he used, but something like top priorities. It was not core interest. And it was Taiwan, and trade, and Xinjiang, and I can't remember the other two. Uh, and the sixth one was South China Sea. And then he said, basically, the South China Sea is, uh, an uh, China has unchallengeable sovereignty in the South China Sea. And went on at some length about the position on the South China Sea. Um, I was struck by that formulation. I was struck by the attention that he gave to the South China Sea, along with these other critical issues. Because at the time, frankly, it did not seem to me to measure up to the other issues in importance to China. Um, and frankly, when I got home from that, I began an interagency process to look at South China Sea policy, which resulted in the statement that Secretary Clinton made in Hanoi, which formulated much more fully our policy towards the South China Sea. Now again, and your question is very good, and it's very apt. I, I've seen numerous senior American officials refer to China having asserted that South China Sea is a core interest. Um, I've had, I spoke to a, a Chinese friend about it, asked him, and he said oh, he thought that some senior PLA official had, had done so, but he couldn't document it. Um, the Chinese have a great deal of difficulty walking away from it because they don't want to say it's not, you know, now that it's out there. Uh, but there is no question in my mind that they, would, that they would prefer that this matter had never been raised and that it had not been defined as a core interest. If by core interest, you know, I don't personally get all hung up on these semantical points, but I suppose the word core interest, to the extent that it's definable, means that it's something on which China cannot negotiate, cannot negotiate sovereignty. And that's why they refer to Taiwan, Tibet, and Xinjiang as core interests. Clearly, on South China Sea, um, uh, they do not, at an authoritative level, consider the same category as those three issues.
Okay, but Suchi, why don't you take charge of the questions so that I don't... No, that's okay, but I think I can shout technology. Let's move back. Uh, I want to move back from Southeast Asia back to Northeast uh, Asia uh, because I'm fascinated by the uh, fact of, uh, of Kim Jong Un's uh, new uh, the, the new ruler of North Asia, North Korea. He seemed to be to have uh, gotten out of the role of a playboy. And uh, because of the fact that he's been uh, educated abroad, etc., etc., uh, I kind of I sensed some movement in the in North Korea's uh, heretofore immovable stand vis a vis the rest of the world. Uh, do you agree, you know, or do you think that it was just? A wrong impression on my part. Okay. Um, Ambassador Lowe is uh, 90 years old and he still writes uh, weekly open <laughs> columns. Yeah. That's um, spectacular. <laughs> uh, I probably would have given a different answer to your question three weeks ago than today. Uh, it's certainly. Well, okay, let me try this on several levels. First of all, the, the uh, so-called deal that we had negotiated with the North Koreans that would have provided them with 240,000 metric tons of food aid, uh, and they would have accepted a monitored freeze of their uranium enrichment program, a moratorium on nuclear tests, on missile tests, reiterated their support for the armistice agreement and adherence to the 2005 joint statement. Um, that was certainly an encouraging moment. Uh, we had been laying out those conditions for at least a year uh, as the basis for resumption of six-party talks. And um, before Kim Jong-il died, in November of 2011, we began hearing from the North Koreans um, that this was doable, that they, that they could accept this framework. Then Kim Jong-il died, um, and it did not take very long under the new leadership for them to come back to the administration and say, yes, they were prepared to go ahead. Uh, and I know there were North Korean officials at a track two conference in New York about a month ago who were saying different kinds of things about North Korea's intentions and North Korea's policy to the effect that unlike their predecessors, they now were seeking um, a peaceful relationship with the United States. Uh, and then within weeks after the announcement of this agreement, the North Koreans made clear they were going to go ahead with this satellite launch. Now, the satellite launch, they may call it a satellite launch, but it's not a satellite launch. It's an intercontinental ballistic missile. I mean, as one of my friends in the intelligence community said at the time, in 2009, when we faced the same issue, it doesn't matter what they call a satellite or they call a refrigerator. It's all the same thing. <laughs> It's just, a, you know, it's a ballistic missile with a certain amount of weight on it. And we believed at the time they were not capable of putting the satellite into orbit. They do not have much of a satellite industry at all. And they didn't. They announced that it was broadcasting North Korean patriotic songs. Uh, I'm still searching for that frequency. I can't find it. Um, now, during the negotiations this time, our negotiators made clear to the North Koreans that the definition of a missile moratorium included satellite launches. That was what the UN Security Council presidential statement said in 2009 in order to close the satellite loophole that the North Koreans were trying to exploit that. 
And the Chinese and the Russians accepted that statement and signed on to it. So for the North Koreans to go ahead with this just two weeks after this agreement um, suggests that certain things in North Korea never change. I mean, it's like their attitude on light water reactors, frankly. I mean, they have long wanted a light water reactor. And by 2006, the Bush administration made clear to them, you're not getting a light water reactor. And they continued to push and push and push. And in the 2007 statement, there was some reference to a light water reactor. Chris Hill got up and said, basically, it's never going to happen. Um, uh, and now the North Koreans assert that they have built a light water reactor. And Dr. Hecker, uh, one of our leading nuclear scientists, has seen it from the outside and said, at least from the outside, it looks, you know, it looks impressive. Actually, it was the uranium enrichment facility, but the light water reactors right nearby. So this is the same thing. I mean, the North Koreans, basically, what they do is they negotiate, and they negotiate, and negotiate, and negotiate, and then you reach the agreement, and then they take the part that, that um, they um, were forced to compromise on, and they start to try to renegotiate that. So they are basically trying to proceed with this satellite launch, this rocket launch, and have us go ahead with the deal. Um, and to do that would completely undercut three years of messages that we've been trying to send to North Koreans that we are not going to reward bad behavior. So in my view, there's no choice but to basically say the food aid will not proceed. Now, there's an article of faith in the U.S. and in the humanitarian community that you do not link food aid to political issues. Um, I'm personally not persuaded by that argument. I never have it with regard to North Korea. Because for North Korea, North Korea, North Korea, North Korean government refers to food as a strategic good. I mean, that's how they think about food, unlike the rest of us. Um, and North Korea could end its malnutrition problem tomorrow if they would abandon their weapons of mass destruction program, which is siphoning off most of their resources. Um, so I, I'm completely comfortable with this linkage, uh, even though no one, including in the U.S. government, will say so, because it like, runs against theology. But um, I guess I'm not. Uh, I don't know, nor do I think anyone knows, what role Kim Jong-un is really playing. Uh, he is, what, 27, 28 years old. Um, he's an assistant by some pretty tough guys who go back very far together, who I don't think uh, are, all that, are all that impressed by a 28-year-old who suddenly went from being um, a nobody to being a four-star general in one day. It's a quick promotion system they have. Um, um, so I don't, uh, I think that he, you know, that the other elders in the North Korean system are all wedded to the Kim dynasty. They need the Kim dynasty to survive. But without the Kim dynasty, um, the place has a serious chance of disintegrating uh, into factions or worse. So they all unite behind him and unite beyond, behind the Kim dynasty for reasons of survival. But that doesn't tell us that he is really calling the shots or will be calling the shots for some time. I mean, I think it's entirely impossible he will be at some stage. Um, I'd say, I don't feel he has checked back in five years and see how he's doing. I think, I think that there are a number of other key actors, in particular Kim Jong-il's uh, brother-in-law, Chang song Tech, who are playing a large role uh, in driving North Korean policy. And I don't think that they are looking to um, turn around the direct the policies that have been driving North Korea for some time. You know, I mean, until North Korea 
leaders decide that they're willing to undertake economic reform, which they have not been. It's hard to picture uh, substantial changes in North Korea. And they have not been willing to undertake economic reform because the elite doesn't need it. And they don't much care about the rest of the population. So I, I guess I agree that for a few brief weeks, it looked as if we might be looking at something different. But it's hard to draw that conclusion right now. Uh, I'm convinced the North Koreans are going to go ahead with the satellite launch. We've been talking to the Chinese. And the Chinese, I gather, have called in the North Koreans at least twice uh, in the last few weeks to warn them not to proceed. The North Koreans are going to proceed. They're not going to pay attention to anyone. That's their nature. This was what I had in mind. Beijing has somehow changed its stance. Beijing has somehow changed its stance vis-à-vis this North Korean uh, problem. It's you know, giving them as, as big a headache as they are giving Washington. I, I think, you know, around 2006, 2007, around the time of the nuclear test, I think there was a very serious debate in Beijing about support to North Korea, about whether it was worth it, about whether they needed to try to change approach. Um, my sense is in late 2009, that debate was closed again, that the Chinese decided that the risk of North Korean collapse was unbearable, uh, and that they had to express solid, and they thought it was a serious risk. And so they began shoring up the North Korean regime again. Um, uh, I'm sure they, they hate it. I'm sure they regard it as a, uh, a dreadful burden. But they don't. They haven't figured out what the alternative is. Uh, Joanne, uh, Dr. Bader, it's great to see you again in Taipei. And uh, uh, Joanne Chen from Academic Seneca. I wonder whether you would like to uh, share some of your personal observation of Xi Jinping as a future leader of China. <laughs> and the implication for U.S.-China and cross-strait relations. Thank you. Um, I have not had much uh, personal uh, exposure to him. I met him on his trip to Washington and talked to him for a few minutes. Um, I know I have good friends uh, who have spent a fair amount of private, private time with him, including one-on-one -on -one time uh, with him. And I. You know, I spoke to Vice President Biden uh, before his trip and after his trip, and, got, and I know his, his impressions uh, as well. So, uh, first on the personal side, uh, I thought he did a good job in Washington. He manifested, I thought, a nice uh, personal, personal touch. You know, in his, in his speech, to the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and U.S.-China Business Council. He gave a speech that had sort of the usual policy positions, but at the end, he told a story about a, uh, an American man who had grown up, who had spent part of his youth in Fujian province in some village. Um, and the man had died, and she had heard about it, and she met the man's wife. Uh, and invited the wife back to the village. It was a, a long, rather touching story. Um, and what struck me about the story was that, uh, uh, with all due respect to my Ministry of Foreign Affairs friends, and I once worked in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it's not the kind of thing that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs would write into a speech. Um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs writes the policy position. Uh, this was something he clearly added himself. It was like a, a politician's uh, language, and a politician's way of viewing things, um, which impressed me that, um, that he would feel that, that, that this would be what he would want to project, his personal the human qualities uh, on a trip when, after all, he's auditioning for General Secretary of the Communist Party. And apparently in his trip to Iowa, I spoke to some journalists who were out there with, with him, 
And they said he was very impressive. They said he got along great with the farmers and was very personal with the, with the townspeople. You know, Biden's, one of Biden's main impressions of him from his trip was that he was, he reminded them of kind of a hands-on politician. You know, he had experience in Fujian, experience in, uh, in Zhejiang. Um, uh, he had worked his way uh, through uh, the urban issues that politicians have to deal with, you know, labor issues, sanitation, health, transportation, uh, that he did not seem to view things uh, so from 50,000 feet as an ideologue, but rather in practical terms from having dealt with these issues in his personal capacity. Um, you know, when I spoke to him, I was struck that he's very direct, he's very engaged, he listens to you, he's all there, he doesn't seem remote the way some Chinese leaders do. Um, in terms of what kind of a leader he will be. First of all, in terms of his policies, that is unknowable because no one below the top level is going to signal policy differences from the leadership, certainly before he gets there, or he will never get there. Um, so his positions, I think, are unknowable. He's, uh, he had some reputation as a, an economic reformer in Zhejiang. Um, and people I know who have spoken to him at length privately say that he's a man of very considerable understanding of the problems that China has, both economically and in governance, that, that the, he understands them. He doesn't just give formulaic answers in private. And what we do, um, I think there's a, couple, a few ways to look at it. One is that you know, every Chinese leader since Mao has chosen to put his own mark on policy uh, somewhere early in his tenure. You know, with Hu Jintao, it was harmonious society. Um, uh, Jiang Zemin, it was, you know, it was rapid growth and uh, his Taiwan policy. Um, Deng Xiaoping, third plenum. Um, I think it is predictable that Xi Jinping will want to do something in some area in his first year that makes it clear that it's no longer the Hu Jintao year. Okay. Now, what that would be is more speculative. And China is facing uh, a crushing array of problems and challenges uh, in the next few years, um, overwhelmingly on the domestic side. Um, a lot of them having to do with, uh, with the role of the Communist Party uh, uh, in state-owned enterprises, with the disproportionate influence uh, of state-owned enterprises, with the linkages between the party, the state-owned enterprises, the credit system, uh, the way in which that distorts sound economic uh, decision-making. Um, you know, many people look at the latest World Bank DRC report, which deals with a lot of these issues very candidly. I, I think that that report lays out very well the challenges, the, the top challenges that Xi Jinping will face at the beginning. And I would think that something in this broad array of problems would be where he'd want to make his mark. So I can't, I, I, I don't see him as seeing his role as the dismantling of the privileges of the Communist Party. That is not what he uh, is taking that position to do. Um, he also is only one among nine, if in fact there are going to be nine members of the Standing Committee again. Um, there's a vacancy, by the way, uh, but anyway. Um, it's a joke. Um, there, there, there's a decent chance that we die, despite the recent mishaps. Um, so he will not be a, a, a free agent. Um, uh, you know, I, I think we all, when we prognosticate, we all tend to see continuity until suddenly we're surprised. And there's not continuity. Um, and, uh, I, so, I think what, what China really needs right now is another Jurongji. That's what they need. They need somebody who is prepared to uh, 
defy or ignore special, the special interests and the bureaucracy uh, and the lower voices in the party uh, and do what needs to be done to make China into a seriously competitive uh, economy rather than one that's dominated by a few privileged institutions. Uh, Ji Rongji was arguably the least popular man in the Communist Party during his tenure, but what he accomplished was extraordinary. Um, you know, would Xi Jinping be another Ji Rongji? I don't know. I'd say that there's less than a 50% chance that he would choose to take on the uh, elites and the um, privileged powers of the fashion that, that Jew did, but it's not impossible that he would do it selectively. Um, the greater chances are that the approach will be to mull through. That's, you know, that's what's been happening for most of the last decade. And um, that's generally the easiest course. But then again, as I say, uh, uh, this is all unknowable today. Thank you. May I ask uh, Professor Professor Liu, is uh, Professor now uh, former uh, foreign ministry official. He's been holding his hand up for a long time. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Su uh, Dr. Peters, um, it is a really great honor as a member of uh, Brookings uh, welcoming uh, a current Brookings member coming over to talk about the policy issue. Uh, the first, first issue which uh, my colleague uh, Professor Chen already mentioned earlier, it is about uh, Chinese uh, uh, assertive diplomacy linking up with uh, the South China Sea and also assertive diplomacy because uh, throughout, as you mentioned, 2010, uh, people, security experts in the region, almost talking about how does it uh, come to this, uh, this uh, outcome. And many people point to uh, the exact person, you, uh, is the person at the center of this uh, core interest, uh, Chinese uh, core interest that uh, claims uh, for the South China Sea. So, uh, so far, I have uh, researched through the process and I discovered many different resources. And the first one, probably after you met a Chinese uh, senior official, and it came to uh, New, uh, New York Times in March uh, 2010, and later on, uh, Japanese uh, Kyoto the news agency reported it in June and then spread uh, almost uh, immediately in Southeast Asia. The country in Southeast Asia started to look into this uh, very tough, uh, difficult Chinese and then almost uh, the sea change, uh, that was the uh, critical year. So uh, since you are at the center of this, and I'm wondering if uh, this, this uh, uh, approach was uh, orchestrated uh, by your government or it just happens in a way as, as you described. This is a very quick uh, uh, question first. And the second one, uh, when you describe uh, this, uh, uh, the US return uh, to Asia, but now uh, the new uh, military strategy suggested there would be two difficult, difficult spots. One is China in East Asia, the other one is Iran. So now in the region, Japanese, Korean, and some others share the same feeling that how serious the U.S. will stay uh, in Asia if there is something happening in the Middle East. If uh, Iran turns out to be another hotspot, how exactly your government is going to face up to this uh, really big challenge? Thank you. Um, first on where did the assertiveness come from and did we anticipate it? I think where the assertiveness came from was a, uh, it kind of grew in a very fertile soil in China. Since, well, since at least 2008 and probably earlier, there was a growing literature among Chinese national security analysts uh, asserting that the U.S. was in decline. Um, this literature became much more pronounced in 2008 with the financial meltdown, which seemed to provide ample evidence for the decline of theory. Uh, this was combined with a view that the US was dis distracted by the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. And so you put this all together uh, in the view of 
the people who were dominating public discourse in China. Uh, the U.S. was a uh, declining, weak, distracted power. Uh, and all you had to do was read the Western media. Uh, you couldn't pick up a paper without seeing articles about China's rise manifest in uh, every article on every subject. And I think a lot of, I think that a lot of Chinese began uh, believing their press clippings. Uh, and some of the security analysts began asserting that China's time had come. America was in decline, that the uh, utility uh, and appropriateness of Deng Xiaoping's, you know, Taiwan Yanghui uh, warnings was passed. Uh, that uh, China should uh, you know, should swing, swing its weight. Okay? Um, I don't believe there was ever a policy decision. I don't think the Public Bureau Standing Committee ever had a meeting in which they decided let's be more assertive. That didn't happen. At least I'm convinced it didn't happen. Uh, I spoke to a lot of Chinese security analysts whose views I trust in 2010 about Chinese conduct that year. Uh, and, and some of them were dismayed about Chinese conduct. And I said to one of them, well, why don't you write something about it? Uh, he said, I can't. I said, well, why not? He said, well, uh, what if I try to write anything that questions the sort of the servers, uh, my, you know, my server gets blown up by millions of hostile blog postings calling me a traitor and worse. Um, so I keep quiet. You know, I, I said, well, that's not a very satisfactory situation. What you need is some cover. I mean, you know, you can't, I said, you can't even cite Deng Xiaoping. He said, no, you can't. It was in the fall of 2010. That was very telling to me. And that's why I emphasized Dai Bing Guo's article. Because I think Dai Bing Guo's article was, came out of this environment and, and he was conscious of what was going on. Uh, and he knew there was a need to provide official cover for people to say sensible and balanced things to rebut the, sort of the retired three stars um, who were writing all this all this stuff, you know, the Yellow Sea is a Chinese sea and American aircraft carriers cannot be permitted to enter the Yellow Sea because it's a vital interest of China, that kind of thing. You know, and that kind of thing gets written in, you know, the Global Times and the MFA gets scared. And so you have the Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesman issue a statement in response to false reports out of South Korea saying that we we're going to deploy the George Washington to the LOC. And then the MFA is supposed to issue a statement saying this would be, you know, threatening. This would be uh, inappropriate. And it's a crazy statement. We weren't even planning it. And the MFA is just a statement because they're intimidated by this public discourse. Well, once the Chinese government had issued a statement saying we can't go in the LOC, well, that pretty well took care of that. Um, that meant we were going to go to the LLC because it's international water, and obviously we cannot accept um, a government declaring uh, some international water uh, out of bounds for our military. So uh, there was just an environment growing out of perceptions of American weakness and American decline that produced a series of isolated decisions, in my view. Okay? The, uh, a lot of the bluster earlier in the year was in response to the Taiwan arms sale, the threats against Boeing and GE and other companies that was specific to that decision. Um, the embrace of North Korea had to do with fear of collapse of North Korea. Uh, the South China Sea that was not sudden, that was kind of incremental Chinese greater presence in the South China Sea dating back a decade. That was not something that suddenly happened. Uh, our response was somewhat sudden in July 2010, 
but the Chinese, have, and, and you know, frankly, one of the reasons why I pushed for that response and coordinated this interagency process to produce a new position in the South China Sea was because since Chen Chi Chung, the Chinese had abandoned diplomacy in the South China Sea. When Chen Chi Chung was in, in office, they had negotiated a declaration of conduct. They had basically agreed on a moratorium on new facilities in the South China Sea. But in the last 10 years, that was gone. And what I was looking to do was to revive the Chen Chi Chung spirit, which I think to some degree has succeeded. Um, and the Sengaku's Tiaru situation, that was, again, that was sudden, unexpected. And the Chinese were not the only ones who were to blame in some of the activities there. Uh, in some respects, the Japanese did not handle it greatly either. But the Chinese managed to get the worst of it in public image by their, by their threatening behavior on rare earths. So, um, did we anticipate it? I, I won't say that we anticipated the 2010 of the year of a certain Chinese behavior, but we always anticipated that we, you know, as I say from the outset, we understood we had to remain forward deployed, uh, and we had to be prepared to respond uh, if and when China crossed certain lines. So that was part of, I think, a, a broader understanding rather than a, um, a, a strategic plan on our part. And I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the last part of your question was... Uh, Oh, Iran and China. Iran and China. Um, look, uh, Panetta went to Asia, okay? And then President Obama went to Asia. And their central message in both visits was that we were looking at $500 billion in defense cuts in the next 10 years, but they would not be at the expense of U.S. capabilities in the Asia Pacific. That was their number one message. And that was the message you know, of the so-called pivot on Obama's November visit. I mean, I, I wouldn't call it a pivot. I would call it a statement of, of sustained capability. But they would not be making those statements and highlighting uh, our capabilities if the intention were to focus all of our resources on the Straits of Hormuz uh, and forget about Asia. Then uh, it, it would, that would make Panetta and Obama into bluffers, and trust me, they are not. Okay, Jeff. Uh, well, time is really up, but uh, I really don't want to abuse our friendship. <laughs> but I, uh, I saw three hands popping up already. You're in charge. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask each one of them to quickly shoot the questions, and you get a pick which one you want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> one or two, all right? Uh, we have a uh, scientist here, and a journalist there, and a uh, former journalist. Uh, maybe in that order, uh, Mr. Sun, and uh, Dr. Sun, and Mr. Sun. Mr. Mr. Yeah, please. In, in the order of appearance. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Sushi, and uh, nice to have you here, Dr. Peter. Uh, I have a, a, a very, uh, actually, a simple question. Uh, in your previous remarks, you mentioned that the uh, U.S. arms sale toward Taiwan was still going on, uh, according to the Taiwan Risk Act. But you put the August 17th communique in. So everybody knows that the, uh, the August 17th communique, the U.S. is trying to really decrease its arms sale to Taiwan, not in quantity or quality. But uh, obviously, uh, the Taiwan Relations Act does something different. And China is rising now, it's much more powerful. So uh, what, what do you have in your mind about the future of U.S. arms sales to Taiwan or uh, U.S. I'm going to say protection, but the U.S. Uh, uh, ability to uh, control over this region in your, in your, in your mind? Professor Sun, a former legislator, serving as chairman of Foreign Relations Committee of Parliament. I'd like to ask you something more interesting. While China's future leader, Xi Jinping, was preparing his way to Washington, D.C., 
something unprecedented happened to the U.S.-China relationship. That is the local high-level security office of Chongqing City, named the Wang Liju, went 300 miles all the way to the Consulate General Office of Chengdu, perhaps asking for political assignment. Okay. Now, Bo Xilai, uh, the party chief of uh, Chongqing, sent armed forces surrounding the Consulate General Office of the United States, requesting for his release. Now, after that, you know, Bo Xilai was purged. Okay. The United States government so far kept silent, said nothing. Okay. Do you think this is the beginning of some kind of reemergence of the communist left leftist force, which may lead to some social and economic unrest. Or you think it's something Beijing leadership will just take care of on its own. Uh, we're waiting for the United States to say something. Or you rather want us to wait for the next round of WikiLeaks. <laughs> and, uh, excuse me, Eric Shi uh, with uh, Zhongtian Xinwen and uh, formerly uh, CNF Stella at the bookings. Well, essentially the same question, your take on the uh, Wang Jun affair and the downfall of what she like. So I get to choose between the August 17th communique and Bo Xi Lai, huh? <laughs> well, the reason I mentioned both the August 17th communique and the Taiwan Relations Act is that is U.S. policy. Um, it's been U.S. policy for, you know, for 30 years. Um, the, uh, the August communique um, it's susceptible to different kinds of interpretation. Um, it's been interpreted differently down through the years. George H.W. Bush's decision to sell F-16s to Taiwan in 1992, I'm sure, was viewed as contrary to the communique uh, by Beijing. Um, the Obama administration has sold $13 billion in arms to Taiwan in the last three years, which as far as I know is the most that any administration ever has done uh, in a comparable period. So in my mind, questions about the future of arms sales, uh, let's just say I, I think they're premature. Um, the behavior of the Obama administration suggests that, uh, that this uh, hypothetical new era is not, is not upon us. Um, as for Bo Xi Lai, um, uh, thank God the American government isn't making comment on this, all I can say. <laughs> I think that the U.S. government has been uncharacteristically discreet in keeping its mouth shut uh, about what happened when Wang Li Jun visited. That's the last thing in the world we should be talking about. Uh, we as a government, happily, I'm no longer in the government, so I can say anything I want. Um, but no, I mean, it, for the U.S. government to uh, apparently, well, either to be commenting on supposed asylum requests is completely inappropriate. For the U.S. government to be saying things that would appear to be trying to um, influence the political transition in China, which of course we have zero ability to affect, but anything we say would be interpreted as trying to do that would be profoundly unwise. Uh, and so what this, you know, I, I, in any case, I hardly see the purging of Boshi Lai as a sign of the resurgence of the left. On the contrary, uh, it suggests, well, I, it's one of these things that, that history is going to have to judge. I have my own interpretation. I mean, I, there was an interesting article in the New York Times, I think it was today or yesterday, describing the uh, thuggishness and the gangsterism uh, of uh, the Bull administration in dealing with uh, organized crime or supposed organized crime. And that, I think, is the, I think, frankly, that's the real story here. I think that the allegations against Ball and his family were so uh, extreme and so beyond the pale, even in the Chinese system, 
that once these allegations became broadly known on the internet, which they are and will be, I mean this thing got tremendous attention on the Chinese internet right away, there was no way, in my view, that he could be sustained in his position with this kind of thuggish behavior going on. That for, the, for the rest of the party to spring to the fence of this kind of behavior, this isn't you know, your ordinary $100,000 kickback for land permit, which no one, you know, at this point people are inured to. This is well beyond that. So I think there were particulars to the case that made Ball's position unsustainable. Now, how much this got caught up in larger factionalism or politics in Beijing, uh, that is kind of invisible to me, frankly. Um, some of this prominence clearly, and Boss, long been a very controversial figure, of course. Uh, I have no doubt that once he got into trouble, um, there were people you know, ready to push him. Um, for reasons having nothing to do with the fuckishness, but for political reasons, I don't doubt of that. And of course, there's been a lot of attention in the last year to the supposed Chongqing model and, and the Guangzhou model and to Bo Xilai and Wang Yang. And um, so, you know, his persona has been politicized uh, pretty substantially. Uh, but in any case, I don't, I don't think one can interpret the outcome as a, a sign of successful research of leftism. I mean, certainly one job about it depicted the decision preemptively as an attempt to um, cut the head off of leftism before it could reassert itself. Um, I mean, I think that the developments in Kong were equally interesting, frankly, a few months ago, in the way in which Wang Yang uh, handled the uprising there, which is, I think, not what many of us expected. And it seems to have handled it, handled it well uh, with, with uh, constructive results. I, I think it would be interesting to see if he moves up. Um, as I think was widely expected uh, a year ago, um, I think that's a sign that a certain kind of more conciliatory and reform minded approach uh, is, uh, still has a place in, in the Beijing leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, for your insightful uh, speech and uh, uh, particularly for your generosity in giving us such a, such a long period. period. I, uh, I just counted, I think we have eight or nine uh, people who raised questions. Uh, he, uh, from what I could tell, he gave us a lot of insights, but I'm sure there are a lot of things left unsaid. And we have to really read his book to find out <laughs> what was said. <laughs> And I have, uh, through my years of research, I have bought, not necessarily read, many memoirs written by American uh, uh, policy makers, from Kissinger on down to the um, president, and all the way to speech writing. And one of the observations I like to make here today is that I find out that the number of pages uh, of a certain memoir is not directly related to the importance of the person or the length of time he or she is in office. But the thickness is directly related to how relevant the person was when he wrote that memoir. In other words, the longer the memoir, the less relevant the person is. <laughs> and the shorter the memoir, the more relevant the person is still that day. And his memoir is only 150 pages. So I have the hunch that even though Jeff is out of office now, he's still relevant. So, which makes all the more necessary that we have to read this memoir very closely. That's what I, what I will do. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have a lack of funding, and because we are still short of funding, so we cannot pay people like that like just for uh, cross-Pacific or cross-continental airfare. Uh, so in case you have any friends who are already in Taiwan, coming to Taiwan, already paying, uh, let me know. And maybe we'll ask him or her to give a, 
to share with us his thoughts. Thank you very much.